And good morning, uh, everyone. I'm glad to and thankful to be able to uh, come to you at Facebook Live this morning. Uh, another Lord's Day uh, that we have an opportunity to meet together and in, in this way. Uh, maybe not <clears throat> exactly the way we would like to. Uh, and, and soon, I, I believe we'll be we'll be back to being in the church house, but but right now we're here, and I'm thankful for, for all that are able to join with us in our Camp Creek Community Church family, so welcome one and all, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited, and, um, and also, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, uh, just overwhelmed by the message this morning, and just um, so just pray for me and uh, speaking of prayer we want to go to the Lord in prayer a couple of specific prayer requests uh, at our, our missionary Rudy Rico his his wife uh, uh, Tess who had a stroke and is bedridden uh, there in the Philippines uh, has physical therapy coming in a couple of times a week but at this time she's uh, unable to uh, to get out of the bed and um, so just let's remember her and our, our prayers. Um, as Stephanie uh, Hendricks mentioned, uh, uh, a, a stillborn, a, f a friend of hers that was they buried yesterday, and um, Nita's family, the the tragic drowning uh, accident, the young child, and and all that situation going on there. Those are those are um, heart wrenching and. Uh, we must lift him up to the Lord in prayer, and and uh, my <clears throat> my uncle Chuck and uh, Aunt Darlene, their their grand uh, daughter Layla, uh, ha had a possible seizure this morning, and the mom and dad's rushing her to the hospital even now. So let's uh, remember little Layla. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and lift up your request to the Lord, Father. We we are thankful that you hear and answer prayer and and even as we've mentioned uh, situations and some uh, are so desperate and how, how do you pray for uh, a, a family that loses a little one uh, I have no words for that other than God just um, crying out to you for them and asking you to to do a work of grace and, and healing and comfort that can only come from you. Be with these families, Lord, uh, that are that are grieving, not this, just these, but there's others as well, uh, even in our own family as, as Mary and, and the rest of us uh, mourn the loss of her mom. And, and God, thank you for, for being with us and loving us. And, and comforting uh, us. Uh, be with Sister Tess, Father, and Brother Rudy, and give them strength and healing according to your will. Be with little Layla right now. Uh, I, I can only imagine how how uh, terrifying this is for her. Uh, she's nine years old, and also for her mom and dad and the rest of the family. It's 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 scary, but help us, Lord, just to trust you. So be with this family and comfort this little one in her and her folks and um, God uh, God work in this situation even um, uh, heal heal her father and uh, but we we must we must uh, bring all these requests father uh, under your authority Lord and in, in, in your will and but you know our hearts Lord so answer these prayers many others, I, I know there's more on my heart and I could continue in prayer and uh, and I know that there's there's those requests that are on each person's heart the the burdens we have uh, uh, the sickness and the death the sorrow uh, the uncertainty uh, the the desperate situation of our nation oh God um, just guide us uh, God, our leaders, uh, I don't know how else to pray that, Lord. I just have to lift it all up to you. And I'm thankful, Father, that, that you're at work. We know that the evil one is at work, 
and, and we see things coming to pass that, uh, that you have told us in your word uh, that Satan and, and those that, that uh, follow him are, are going to bring about. But we also know, Father, that you are in ultimate control and, and we can trust you. Uh, in these things because you have a purpose and you are going to make all things right. So so work in our hearts and lives and in the lives of our communities and our nation and our churches. Oh God, I pray that our that even our little church will be back in our in our building again soon. I thank you that we've had this opportunity to be able to do this uh, online and um, and I don't want I don't want this to end either God. So just work out all these details so but um, most importantly right now, God, I pray you would uh, hide me behind the cross, m meaning, Lord, just, just take m me, take Bill Sweeney out of the equation, even though I'm in, my, in the flesh. Uh, God, fill me with your spirit and give me the words and even the understanding um, and the clarity as we look at your word, God, that you would work in each, uh, in each life as only you can. Strengthen the saved, Lord. Save the lost. For your honor and glory and our eternal good, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, <clears throat> as we come to uh, the scripture this morning, again, continuing our study in the Gospel of John in chapter 11. And this uh, morning, our text is going to be John chapter 11, verses 28 through 37. John chapter 11 verses 28 through 37 and let's go right to our text now and and get into uh, and and get into the word this morning. So John chapter 11 and verse 28 and when she had so said this was Martha speaking when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And say, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? And may God add his... Uh, his blessing and his understanding to the reading of his word. We, we asked a question last week, um, what do we do when God doesn't make sense? And, and, and I would add to that, uh, what do we do when we have unanswered questions? And we, we looked at, at both of those uh, last, last Sunday. We, remember, we saw back in, in this chapter in verse 6 that uh, that Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And because he loved them, he waited two days before he left when he knew that Lazarus was, was seriously ill. Uh, and, and, and Jesus, he told his disciples in verse 14, he had to tell them plainly that Lazarus was dead. And he said, and I'm glad that I wasn't there for your sakes, that, that ye might believe. Now, these are very difficult things. Why would Jesus wait two days? Why would he say that he was glad he wasn't there? Well, he, t he told them so that you would believe. Uh, there was a purpose of God in all of this that was, 
was taking place. Uh, and, and of course, they were having to go back now uh, to, uh, to Bethany. They were having to go back there to Judea, right near Jerusalem, where they were seeking to kill Jesus. And then Thomas is like, well, let's, let's just go with him and we'll, and we'll die with him. So, um, and so when he came then to, uh, to Bethany, as he got near to the town, uh, the word came to Martha that Jesus was coming. And when she knew that he was coming, she went to where Jesus was. She went to Jesus before he got uh, to the town. And, and, uh, and Mary, though, obviously did not know that Jesus had come as she was in the house and she was, and she was mourning. Um, and, and so when uh, we saw those personality di differences between Martha and Mary, Martha the one always up and moving around and always going, and Mary the one that was more uh, uh, quiet, and, and, and we see that even, even here. Uh, but, and, but, and Martha uttered that statement, Lord, if, uh, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And, and then she followed that up by saying, and, and even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. So uh, there, was a, uh, there was a broken heartedness. Martha wanted the Savior there. Martha knew, as we're going to see Mary as well, that if Jesus had been there, Lazarus would not have died because nobody died around Jesus. And in fact, he healed. He had already healed, we know in Scripture, uh, two, uh, in two places in Scripture, but these were recent deaths. Now, this is, this is a different situation entirely because Lazarus has been dead four days. So Martha even knows that Jesus can raise the dead, and she says, and now, I, I know even now, if you, whatever you ask, that you, the Father will do it. I mean, the Father will give it to you, even raising the dead. Yet we're going to see a little bit later that even that little bit of faith that she had was even stretched because Lazarus had been dead four days and was de and was decaying. But but see uh, when Jesus and he tells her that Lazarus is going to rise and 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 she says I know he's going to rise in the last day. Jesus had taught about that that all all people will be raised in that in that final day. And those that know Christ, yes, will be judged according to our works, but not for our salvation because our salvation was purchased by Christ. And so those of us that are in Christ will be raised to resurrection of life. But those that are, that are not in Christ, those who die in unbelief, then, then their place is in the lake of fire. But they will be raised into an eternal body and that they will suffer for all eternity. Only those in Christ will be resurrected unto eternal life with the Father and with the Son. <clears throat> so he, he explains this to her. Uh, it, it, she says, I know there'll be a resurrection in the last day. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I just don't bring resurrection and life. I am resurrection and life. He is the, the eternal incarnate word of God that became flesh. And then he says, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you, do you believe this, Martha? And she made that statement. Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the, the Messiah sent from God, that thou art the Son of God, the eternal Word of God that became flesh, that should come into the world, that is the fulfillment of all the prophets and, 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 and the Psalms. It is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Scriptures. He is the Christ that should come into the world. And Martha confesses that to Christ. She did not fully comprehend it or understand it, yet she believed that Jesus was who he said he was uh, in that limited capacity that she had. And so when she uttered that, that's what brings us to our text. After she professes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God that should come into the world, then when she had said this, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly. So we don't see how that 
how that ended the conversation with, with Martha and Jesus because the scriptures just recorded as soon as she makes this profession of faith, then she went and in secret and she went to Mary in secret. Now you might say, well, why did she go secretly to Mary? Mary's in her house mourning. There's all the mourners that have come in these four days uh, from Jerusalem and in the surrounding area, their, their family and their friends that have come like a week long uh, time of mourning as Jewish, as the Jewish tradition was. And, and so she's, she's, the house is full. She's in the house and Mary is, is, is in mourning. And so Mary comes to her and it says secretly. So did she motion, get Mary's attention and motion her over? Did she lean over and whisper in her ear? But all we, all we know here is that, um, and, 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 and I can only speculate, but I, I believe that one reason why she would be wanting to tell Mary that Jesus was there secretly is because there was a stir in all of Judea, especially Jerusalem. They were seeking to kill Jesus. Jesus had enemies everywhere that were trying to kill him. Mary and Martha and Lazarus were personal friends of Jesus. They loved him. He loved them. And I believe that Martha was trying to keep this discreet so that the word didn't get out. Well, it wasn't going to stay discreet because that wasn't the purpose of God, what Jesus was about to do. But she goes to her, her, her secretly and says, the master is come and calleth for thee. So again, we don't have the narrative of Jesus asking for Mary to come. But Martha uh, did what the only thing that she could do, the only thing that any of us can do. And I, and I believe that Jesus ha did tell Martha, some would suggest that, that Jesus didn't tell her to, to send Mary, that Martha just made it up herself. I, I don't believe, I don't, I don't see that, but, but here's the thing. And, and this is what's important. Mary needed to be with Jesus. Martha needed to be with Jesus. Martha had gone to be with Jesus. And she can't, she goes to Mary and she says, go to Jesus. Mary is in mourning. Mary is in distress. She's brokenhearted. All Martha can do is point Mary to Jesus. I, I think back to John chapter 6 and verse 68, 69, after Jesus preach that no one can come to the Father except he give it to him and, and you can't come of your own. And, and then he talks about, and you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he was talking spiritual truths and, and he took away their human dignity, their human pride. And then he, he's talking about what in, in, in the natural mind is cannibalism, but he was talking about spiritual things and they left the people left him by, uh, they just, they scattered to where there was only the disciples left. And it was a great multitude that was gathered together. And Jesus looks to his disciples and said, will ye also go away? And Peter, not understanding fully any of what Jesus had just said, he says the only thing that he can say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's nowhere else to go but to Jesus. When nothing makes sense, when everything falls apart all around you, when your heart is broken to pieces, when there's, when there's uh, uh, suffering and death, it's, what the, the little one, ha. How can you make sense of that? How can you, I can't give anything to anybody but tell you, go to Jesus. There's nowhere else to go. Where are you going to turn to your bottle, to your drugs, to your alcohol? Are you going to go seek it with some kind of sexual fulfillment in your lusts and desires or try to fulfill it in some kind of activity? Fill your life full of all the things you want. That's the whole thing about today. Everybody says, oh, whatever makes you feel good. Just do it, just do it, just do it. It's all about me, 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 me. And there's no satisfaction in any of that. There's no comfort in any of that. There's no joy in any of that. There's no fulfillment. There's definitely nothing eternal about any of that because we're temporal and we're dying. Every last one of us are. Where, where else are you going to go with your problems and what's affecting you? 
You can't fix it with drugs. You can't fix it with booze. You can't fix it with illicit relationships. You can't fix it with nothing. Only Jesus can fix what's broken in you. That's why he came, because we're sin sick. And so where else are you going to go? Mary, Jesus is calling for you. Go to Jesus. And when she said, uh, and, and as soon now as she heard that, when Mary heard that Jesus was there and that he was calling for her, she arose quickly. Man, she got up immediately and she went straight to Jesus. Man, child of God, that's the place to go. That's where we go. That's where, that's, there's nowhere else CNF can, can go and I don't care what has happened to you or what you're going through. Go to Jesus and if you don't know Jesus, if you're lost, there is no other place that you're going to find what you're looking for. Now, I can't make you believe that. That is a work of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. I know that God's Word tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all I can offer you is Jesus. There's nothing else to offer you. Somebody sick and say, you know, uh, I want the preacher to go, go visit such and such. That's, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm glad to do that. I ain't got nothing to offer you but Jesus. That's it. And it's, and it's eternal Jesus. And it's eternal life. I can't give you any hope. I ain't got no magic potion. I can't do no hoopla and hoodum and, and, and say a certain thing and name it and claim it in Jesus' name and make your cancer go away. I can't do that. Nobody can do that. If God wants to heal you of your cancer, he can do that. And he does hear and answer prayer. And he can hear my prayer where I pray for, for, for God to, to heal according to his will. And if he does that, it wasn't my prayer that healed you. It was God that answered your prayer. And it was according to his purpose and his will. Man, there's so much of that nonsense going on all around us. Get away from that junk. Jesus came to save your soul. And he's going to raise this corruption must put on incorruption one way or another. This old body cannot go to heaven. Jesus didn't come to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm going to keep saying that because the yahoos on the TV and all over the place are, are saying the words of the devil. He came to save your soul. He came to give eternal life that you could worship and glorify the, the Lord forever. So there's no other hope. So she goes to Jesus, and, and, and now Jesus, he, would, he had not yet made it into, Beth, into the town of Bethany. So Mary goes to where he's at, and, and this is the same place where Martha met him. At. So Jesus calls for Mary, and then he waits right there. He waits for Mary to come. When he called her. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, one of my uh, scriptures I love so much, child of God. And, and this, is for, this is for us and, and those of you that are lost. Listen to the invitation and the words of our blessed Savior. Come unto me, Jesus said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. He calls, come unto me. Is he calling your name? Remember John chapter 10, the previous chapter in, in, the ver in verse 2, that he says that he that entereth by the door of the, uh, is the shepherd of the sheep. He says, I'm the shepherd of the sheep, and, and the porter openeth the door, and the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, and he calls his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Oh man, if you hear the voice of the blessed Savior calling your name, then answer him the call. Go to the Savior and he'll lead you out. The, the 23rd Psalm. Oh, he is our, he is our good shepherd. And, and so but Mary, she goes to Jesus where he has been, where he's waiting for her. And now as she gets up and she leaves in a haste, and remember Martha's told her in secret, the Jews that were with her in the house, mourning with her uh, and, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, they followed her. They followed her to be with her. Why had they come? 
they had come to be with Mary and to mourn with Mary and to, and to try to bring comfort with Mary. Yes, they were mistaken as to why she got up because they said, well, she's obviously she's going to go to the grave to weep there, so let's go with her. She just gets up in a hurry, but it, you know, there's something, I, it, maybe it's, it's minute, and I know I must hurry on because there's a, I'm getting ready to plunge off the deep end here in a minute. But, you know, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. And how can you weep with them that weep if you're not there? And what is Paul, uh, what, what is he telling the church to do? To, to be there for one another. You, you, it's when, when, when tragedy strikes and, and you're like, I don't know what to say. Well, you don't have to say nothing. If you remember Job's friends, when all that happened to Job there in, in Job chapter 2, his three friends, they started out doing the right thing because they went to Job and they saw the distress he was in and the physical condition that Job was in and all that he had suffered and the grief that he bore. And they just came and they sat down for seven days and nights and they didn't say a word. Can you imagine that? And the entire week, they just sat down where Job was just, <laughs> I can't even imagine the condition Job was in. And they didn't say anything. Now, later, they opened their mouth when they shouldn't have. And Job says, miserable comforters are you all. But they did, they did it right to begin with. Man, you don't, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to say anything special. It, you don't have to be the preacher. You, all you have to do is just make yourself avail, available. Just be there. Some of the most important experiences I've had in, in, in hard times that I've gone through is just for a brother to come up and put his arm, his hand on my shoulder. You don't have to say nothing. There's nothing like that, that, that understanding that, hey, I'm here. Just let people know that you're there. And here's the thing. We have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Uh, uh, we have a Savior that says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So even if your friends don't show up, Jesus is always there. But there's something there to, to be learned by that, I believe. But let's go on. So now, uh, when Mary, then verse 32, when Mary was come where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell down at his feet and said unto him, Lord, the, the, it's just what Martha had said, the first part anyways, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. Now, she's at Jesus' feet again. Remember, Martha got mad at her back in Luke chapter 10 because she was sitting at, at Jesus' feet listening to his words when Martha was up and moving around and doing all, taking care of all the stuff. And Mary was the one. She sat at Jesus' feet. And, and when we turn the chapter now, we're going to see that, that Mary, it, she's at his feet again and she's anointing his feet. Uh, and, and here now, she, she falls down at his feet and praying to him. And, and I, heard, I, I read a commentator that said that those three examples of Mary, Mary always at Jesus' feet. She was with his feet when he was teaching, uh, sort of like the prophet. And the priest now, as, as, she, as, she, as she pleads with him, as, as she cries out her heart to him and then anoints him as the king. And then she was anointing him to his burial. burial. Jesus, he's prophet, priest, and king. I don't know if it fits there, but it's true. He is prophet, priest, and king. And Mary knew that there was only place to be no matter what the situation was. No matter what, the place to be was at Jesus' feet. Always, that's the place to be. Child of God, that's the only place we can go. Be like Peter. Who, to whom else shall we go? What are you going to run to? What are you going to turn to? There's no satisfaction there's no help in any other, only in the Lord. Stay at Jesus' feet or, or, or run. If you're away from the Lord, run back to Jesus' feet. But be with Jesus always. And so Mary, and she cries out to him and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. 
And, and so now we come to verse 33. And, and this I approach with fear and trembling because I cannot, I cannot humanly comprehend this text, this scripture. And you'll see what I mean. It said that when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping. And now this weeping, this, this is uncontrolled sobbing. This is a broken heart. Have you ever been with someone that just cried from the depths of their heart? A broken cry, a deep sob. They were broken hearted. Mary and Martha, these that were mourning with him, they, they, were, they were sobbing loudly. They were uh, broken hearted with this. And when he saw them weeping and the Jews weeping, which came with her, the scripture says that he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And we got to stop right here for a minute. And whatever you think that that means, let me just let me just share. And and I'm no I'm no, uh, you know, I don't I don't speak Greek, okay, but I can take my concordance. And and as I look up this word, that he groaned. Uh, this is the idea of that uh, of being deeply moved, but it's it's much more than that. The only, when this word is used in scripture, it always re refers to um, anger or indignation. There is, uh, there is a raw emotion that is happening here. And, and I'm trying to understand now we know that that God overturned the money changers, and we know that Jesus called uh, the 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 Pharisees, uh, uh, you know, blind leaders of the blind. He called them hypocrites, and we know that. We know that Jesus was pure and true, and never he, you know, Paul warns us to be angry and sin not. That was not the case with Jesus. Jesus had righteous anger. Jesus had righteous indignation at times in the scripture. He never once sinned. I, I dare not, I must watch my anger very, very carefully because it is, <laughs> I, I'm very, very capable of sinning in my anger. A matter of fact, it, it's almost impossible for me to get angry and be angry and not sin. It's, it's in that old Bill Sweeney nature because when I get angry, then I want to take matters into my own hands and do something apart from the will of God and what God is telling me to do. Here, Jesus had this righteous indignation, this righteous anger. He was not sinning. And I cannot comprehend that. What was he angry about? He sees them weeping. And, 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 and why? Why did that make him angry? To, to the point that he groaned in his spirit. He was troubled in his spirit. Uh, I believe, it, and, I, and I, I see only one, I, I look at this, and look at what Jesus is coming. Why did Jesus come to the earth now? Why did he come? And 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 we and I believe that Jesus here is he's he is indignant of the pain and the suffering and the sorrow that is that is caused that is accompanied by death and the cause of the sin and the sorrow and the and the and the suffering is Satan. Satan is the originator of sin. And so Jesus he is, he's groaning in his spirit. And so that's within this righteous indignation is, is within him. And he was greatly troubled, meaning that it became, it became visible, that he was, he was visibly upset to where they could see that he was distressed and that he was angry. 
I don't, I don't buy that Jesus, he's looking at, at, at these that are, that are brokenhearted. And, and look, if, 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 if somebody is brokenhearted, it's gonna, it breaks my heart too. And I'm going to weep with them. And, but see, this is not, at least it's not just Jesus being sympathetic and, and, and brokenhearted because, because they're upset. And, and I read one commentator that suggested that Jesus was angry at Mary and Martha and the Jews for not believing in him. And why are you weeping when, when I'm, you know, I'm here and I'm going to take care of it? I don't buy that either. No, no, Jesus, he, he was visibly distressed and, and angry. And, and he wasn't just feeling sorry for them. And he wasn't angry with them for being brokenhearted about this. He was angry at the evil one and what the evil one had brought to this earth. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and uh, in, in, in verses uh, 1 through 5 and, in, and, we, and we read that the serpent that comes after God had put Adam and Eve in the garden in paradise, perfect, and gave them only one command, only one thou shalt not. Do not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And the serpent, Satan in the form of the serpent, goes to Eve and tempts her saying, has God really said that thou will not surely die? You're not gonna die. The reason that God doesn't want you to eat of that tree is because he's trying to keep you from having good stuff because he knows when you eat it, you're gonna be like him and you're gonna understand like him. So he's, the, he's not telling you this because he loves you. He's telling you this because he hates you and he's trying to keep you from doing good stuff. How many, how many young people have been lured away by that lie of Satan when you enter these illicit relationships and, and, we're, and we're trying to find satisfaction in all these different things when God's word says, don't do this. You know that marriage is between one man and one woman and there's only two genders and it's between a man and a woman and it's supposed to be for a lifetime. And by the way, that you are supposed to be chaste and pure until your wedding night. That's the word of God. That's God's way. Now, and it doesn't matter that we, whoever you are and whatever your situation is, whatever law of God you've broken, listen, there's forgiveness with the Lord. But I'm telling you that God gave us his way. And when we step away from God's way, there is consequences for that every single time. And we see this originate in the Garden of Eden with Satan and Eve. And he tempts Eve and he lies to Eve. And Eve took and Adam took and they fell in sin. And now the whole creation is plunged into sin. And all mankind, we, we die, we're dead in our sins because of the sin of Adam. All of this originated with Satan, the evil one. And then there's a promise then. Immediately, as, as God judges Adam and Eve and their sin, and the, and the serpent as well, he, he gives a prophetic, the very first promise of Jesus the very first promise, Genesis 3, 15, he tells the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed. And it, or he shall bruise thy head or crush the head of Satan. He will destroy Satan and thou shalt bruise his heel. Oh, I think about Isaiah 53. He was crushed for our iniquities. But listen, Satan was the originator of that sin. And God told the serpent, he told Satan, he said, the one is coming of the seed of woman, not the seed of man. Mary was a virgin, the, the virgin Mary, Mary and Joseph. Joseph did not know Mary. Jesus did not have an earthly father. He did not have that same inherited sin nature that you and I have. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, but he was born of woman and he defeated Satan. He crushed Satan's head. Satan now, who is the creator and originator of sin. Listen to 1 John 3, verse 8. 
He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. And for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Why did, why did the eternal word of God become man? So that he would destroy the works of the devil. John chapter 8 and verse 44. Jesus, he told the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. And he's the father of lies. And, and he's a murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning. Satan is the creator of sin. He's the creator of lies. He's the creator of murders. He's the creator of death. He's the creator of sorrow. All these things that Jesus came to, to crush Satan and to defeat Satan. And, he, and, the, and the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 that as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, you and I, what are we? We're like Mary and Martha. We're in flesh and blood. We get broken hearted. We get sick. I mean, we're weak. We're human. And we're frail. And we're full of sin. And we're full of doubt. Okay, we are flesh and blood. And because this, Hebrews tells us that he himself, Jesus himself, he took part in the same. He became flesh and blood, but without sin. Remember, he, he, um, uh, that he took also, likewise, took part of the same. That through death, see, Jesus had to become a man so that he could die for fallen man. Only a man could die. God cannot die. But Jesus took on flesh so that he could die in that flesh. Not that God ever died. But he became man so that he could sacrifice himself for us. And the reason that he did that is that through death, through Jesus' death, he might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil, and to deliver them to deliver me who through fear of death were all our lifetime subject to bondage. He didn't take on the nature of angels. He took on him the seed of Abraham. He became a man that he could be like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for and that he suffered being tempted, he's able to succor or he's able to aid or he's able to help those, um, to, to, help, to help those um, that are tempted. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and I can't go through all this chapter, but you could just go read that whole chapter because in Adam all die, so in Christ all that are made alive, all that believe in him are made alive. That that uh, that he that when he when he comes again that at his coming that he shall have delivered when he has delivered up the kingdom of God even to the Father when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power because he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet and listen God's. God's not done yet. The work of Jesus is not done yet because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. Satan, the originator of death. And, and now Christ and those of us that are in Christ, Satan has no more authority over us. He does not have power over us. Yes, we can yield to the temptations of Satan, but we have the Holy Spirit of God that indwells us and one that says he will never leave us nor forsake us. And he that began a good work in you and me will complete it until the day of redemption. And he, that last enemy that will be destroyed is death. At the last trump when the dead in Christ will rise, I'm telling you, and this corruptible must put on incorruption. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 54. As it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The wages of sin is death. We're all going to die because of sin. But that, that sting is death. The sting of death is sin, and, and, the, um, and the strength of sin is the law. 
Because it was the law, God's holy and righteous law. It's our measuring stick and we all fall short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can't justify ourselves. We cannot be righteous in the eyes of God in and of ourselves. There's nothing that we can do. That's why Christ came so that we could be purchased and so that there would no longer be the sting, the sting of, of death, which is sin, that he would have victory over the grave. And Jesus, I mean, now, so, but he groans, you know, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. There's another one to just read and meditate on. You know, the, the prophet tells us that, Isaiah, he tells us that Jesus was a, he, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Listen to just a few of these verses. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Uh, surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He experienced the sorrow and grief with Mary and Martha. Why? Because he, he was flesh and blood. He wasn't an angel. He, he set aside his, his that glory that he had with the Father before the world was. He became a man. He was still perfect. He was still God. But God became a man and he bore our griefs, and he carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. No man suffered like our blessed Savior. There was, never, there was only ever one innocent man uh, that, was, that was ever uh, uh, condemned. Jesus, the only truly innocent man that ever walked the face of the earth. And, and he was wounded for our transgressions, Transgressions. He was bruised. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, because of his broken body and his shed blood, he healed us spiritually. Spiritually, not physical healing. No, spiritually. Uh, and one last verse. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of, uh, uh, of hell and of death. Jesus has the keys. Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And we haven't seen that final victory yet. But he's coming back. And he's coming back, and he's going to call those graves, and all the beloved in the Lord are going to rise into those glorified bodies, and then his victory over death will be complete. Romans 8, Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he lists everything, including death. And what's the end result of that? As we say in West Virginia, Ain't nothing going to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, however you want to say it. I belong to him. I don't know if I did that. I don't know if I did that verse justice or not. Oh God, anything that was built, just take out. But your word penetrate hearts and minds with. And so he says in verse 34, and we must, must hurry along. Where have you laid him? It's interesting now. Jesus already knew Lazarus was dead when the messenger came. Jesus knew where Lazarus was. But, but see, in his humanity, and, and there's that mystery. Jesus is God and Jesus is man, and he did not use his omniscience in this case. He did not say, let's go. He, there was an invitation here. He, he, was, he was seeking for them to invite him to the grave, to the tomb. Where have you laid him, Mary? Where? Where is he? He knew where he was at. God, he, it's not for, it wasn't for his benefit. It was for their benefit that he asked the question. And they said, oh Lord, come and, come and see. And then we come to verse 35. And Jesus wept. This word is only used one time. This is not the same weeping that, that Mary did and Martha did and the Jews did. This is a silent weeping. It's only used one time in Scripture. And the tears, they silently stream down 
our blessed Savior's face. He, he wasn't, Jesus isn't mourning. He's not weeping for Lazarus. He's not shedding those tears for Lazarus because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Lazarus is in a better place because he knows the Lord. What Jesus is going to have to do is to bring him back from paradise into the same old physical body that he had, and Lazarus is going to have to die again. He's not weeping for Lazarus. I believe Jesus is weeping for a, a fallen world that's imprisoned with sorrow and death caused by sin, and he's weeping for those that he loved that are weeping Weep with those that weep. And Jesus is perfect. Oh, what a great high priest we have. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have this great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But we, he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So you and I, believers, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, what a great high priest that we have. He knows our sorrow. He knows our grief. He knows our suffering. He knows our sin. He knows everything about us. And he's there with us. If you are in Christ, then Christ is in you by his spirit. And we can turn to him. And he, he's always going to be there with us. And, and there's something precious about, you know, the, the scripture says that precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saint. Is the death of his saints. And, it, and also another place, that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But listen, when it comes to believers and there's a preciousness there, it says, the, Psalm 30, the psalmist says in 34, 18, that the Lord is near, he's nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as be of a, of a contrite spirit. 147, 3, he heals the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. And it doesn't matter what is the cause of your grief or your sorrow. It could be a tragedy. It could be something unavoidable, unintended, something that you had nothing to do with. It just crashed on you. It could be something that you caused on yourself. It could be consequences for your own sin. Whatever the case may be, if you're broken in heart, if you're contrite in spirit, if you repent, if you turn to the Lord, He's with you. He's with them. He's near to those that are broken heart. Confess your sin to God. Cry out your need to Him, and He's with you. He's with you. Let's finish this up. Here we have in verse 36. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. That's the phileo word. That's that human love. And yes, he did love him. Jesus did love Lazarus. It's already in the text of before we've seen that he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus with that human love. And he also loved them with the agape love, the, the divine love of God. This he was God and man, and he loved them as God, and he loved them as man. And so some said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? If Jesus was able to, to, to heal that man that was, that was born blind from birth, that, meant that they've been talking about in Jerusalem, that's one, they were trying to kill him, remember? Because of the miracles that he had performed, and that one in particular and when he said that he was God and they sought to kill him, but they're like, if he can do that, why couldn't he kept, have kept this man? He loved this man. Why couldn't he, couldn't he have kept him from dying? And, and so, and they thought, now they're mistaken, but they thought that Jesus was weeping because he was unable to help Lazarus. There was nothing he could do about it. Lazarus just died. And, they, and in a way, I think they're mocking him so he could... Heal them. He could heal uh, a man that was born blind, which has never, ever been done before, no, never heard of before. And, you know, why couldn't he have kept this guy from dying? He loved him. What kind of friend is he? What kind of uh, healer is he? I believe it was mocking because it's the same crowd in Matthew 27, that, that same spirit of the Antichrist in verse 42. When they threw it in his teeth, 
He saved others as he's hanging on the cross, dying for our sins. And they say, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Oh, if he's the Christ, if, if he's the king of Israel, uh, and Luke says, if he's the Christ, the chosen of God, we'll let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. Just the evil mocking of Satan's crowd. They weren't going to believe him no matter what he did because their eyes were blinded to truth. And that's where our text ends, and I can't go any farther today, and I'm out of time to boot. There's a little, there's a little chorus that says, um, and by the way, all that have come, and whosoever will may come, whosoever will come, and whosoever has come, listen to me, Oh, how he loves you and me. The little course is Jesus to Calvary to go. His love for sinners to show what he did there brought hope from despair. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. I love you in the Lord. I love you because Jesus loved me. And he gave me his spirit, the spirit of love, that I could love you. And you, in Christ, he gave you that same spirit so you could love me. And we love him. He's in us, and we're in him, and we'll be with him forever. And there's nothing, no circumstance of this world, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate the child of God from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you too can experience that love of God through Christ. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus in that heart of repentance for your sin, turning from your sin and turning to God. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in thy heart that God raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. And that is forever. God bless you. Have a blessed day.